This time it's five classic British lightweight trials bikes. Up until the 1950s, the traditional trials bike was a large, relatively heavy, single cylinder four stroke machine. However, during the latter part of the 50s and into the 1960s, there was a major sea change in the way that people rode their trials bikes. And nimble, lightweight, mostly two stroke trials bikes would come to the fore, eventually completely sweeping away all those heavyweights from a few years earlier, and thus creating the first truly modern trials bikes. And so there are five classic British lightweight trials bikes. BSA Bantam. The BSA Bantam is without a doubt the most numerous of all Britain's lightweight two stroke motorcycles. The machine arrived just after World War II and is, as is widely known, a development of the RT125 from DKW, and therefore, like so many others, is a cousin of the MZ's two stroke range. The first Bantam used a 4.5 horsepower 125 engine. This would quickly grow, however, to 150 and then on to 175, although even early 175s would continue to use a 3 speed transmission, with a 4 speed box not really arriving till the late 60s. 1966 was the arrival of the D10 Sport. This had the 4 speed gearbox and was capable of up to 62 miles an hour. But it would also see the arrival of the Bushman, a dedicated off road machine intended for sales in the Australian outback. But even before the Bushman, the suitability of the lightweight, nimble little Bantam had been much appreciated in trials. And while some trials competitors used lightly modded road bikes, others such as Eric Cheney would heavily modify or even build their own chassis. And some at BSA did realise the potential of the Bantam in the trials theatre. And in fact in 1968, a rare prototype, the D18, was developed specifically for trials use by the competition shop. This used an aluminium barrel and was ridden by Mick Bowers in the International Scottish Six Day Trials that year. But unfortunately, much of the company's management was simply not interested. And even when the end of production came for the Bantam, and some of the guys from the competition shop tried to secure the machine tools to allow them to use the Bantam engine for trials, the management turned them down flat, and even went as far as having the tooling destroyed. An act of sheer madness. These days the Bantam is often seen as an outdated piece of machinery swept away by a more advanced Japanese opposition. But this isn't altogether accurate. The machine could have had a future in trials had it been given the chance. And of course on the road not everyone wants the most powerful, most up to date small bike available. As MZ would prove in BSA's absence, there was a market for a simple, rugged and above all cheap machine. The Cotton Cavalier. The Cotton Motorcycle Company was founded in Bristol Road, Gloucester, by one Frank Willoughby Cotton in 1918. And in fact, Frank would remain at the head of the company that bore his name right through until 1953. By 1913, the company was regularly taking part in trials and would soon discover the limitations of the basic bicycle style frame. And to that end, they would devise the very modern look in triangulated frame in 1913. But the company would also dabble in on-road competition with Stanley Woods winning the 1923 lightweight TT at an average of 55.73 miles an hour on a black burned engine cotton. There's no doubt cotton were best known for their off-roaders both in scrambles and trials. In the 50s and 60s cotton would have considerable success in trials with Villiers powered machines. However this association would end in the late 60s when Villiers stopped supply of power units to companies outside of NBT, leaving Cotton to search around for new engine supplier, which they found in the form of the Minarelli 170 engine. This ran a boring stroke of 60 by 80 and a low compression ratio of 7.9 to 1. The four speed two stroke was ideal for Cotton's needs. And the company would continue production of trials bikes, often in kit form, right through until the end of the 1970s. The Dot Trialster. Initially starting out as a bicycle company, Dot was formed by one Harry Reid in Salford in Lancashire in 1903. 
but by 1906 they had moved into motorcycle production. To help promote his new company, Reed would compete in various sporting events, including taking part in the first motorcycle race to be held in Brooklands in 1908. But the pinnacle of the company's road racing success would come at the 1908 TT, when Reed himself won the single cylinder class. And here the company would continue to have an interest in road racing, with Reed himself racing until 1924. But this would soon come to an end. The company was hit hard by the Great Depression and would cease motorcycle production in 1932, although it would continue to produce tricycles. However, following the Second World War, there was a great demand for lightweight transport. So Dot would rejoin the market, producing a number of small motorcycles powered by Villiers engines. But the company was very keen to get back into competition. A Bernard Scott Wade would produce a lightweight frame which could be easily modified for off-road use. And so in 1951 was introduced the Trial Scrambler, a machine for all manner of off-road activities. And it would prove to be a highly successful trials machine straight out of the box, thanks largely to that lightweight and very capable chassis. And so the machine would be a popular clubman's motorcycle, being employed both scrambling and trials events. For riders such as Eric Adcock, Johnny Griffiths, Ernie Greer and Pat Lamper. However, in the late 60s, Dot were finding it increasingly difficult to compete against larger manufacturers. And when Villiers ceased to supply engines, the company realised that large-scale production was going to be a thing of the past. They did survive, however, and would produce small numbers of trials bikes during the 1970s. And indeed, the factory has survived through to today, supplying parts for their classic-era off-road machines. The Triumph Tiger Cub The Tiger Cub is something of a unique bike in this list, making use, as it does, of a four-stroke single-cylinder engine. Triumph's T20 Tiger Cub began life as the T15 Terrier, in 1952. However, the company soon realised that the bike was somewhat underpowered, and the T20, a 200cc version, was developed in 1954. And while the first models made use of the Terrier's plunger rear suspension system, by 1957 this had been replaced by a true swinging arm rear suspension unit. Now, Triumph weren't slow to realise the potential of the machine. There would be a sports version, which was quickly followed by a scrambles version of all things, and the TR20 Trials version, of course. But while the engine was seen as fairly punchy for the class, the chassis was seen as somewhat flimsy and was heavily modified by those wishing to use it for trials, or some people simply devised their own trials chassis. Later versions would make use of the BSA Bantam frame, which is itself much better suited to off-road work. The engine was a single cylinder unit of 199ccs, with a bore and stroke of 63 by 64 in standard trim, the engine produced just 10 horsepower, but the sports version could make 14 and a half, and in the road bike that meant a top speed of just around 75 miles an hour. And the use of the tiny 200cc cub in trials would prove a masterstroke. It would be an extremely successful motorcycle. However, by the late 60s, there was no escaping the fact that the Tiger Cub engine was somewhat longer than the tooth. So the machine was phased out in favour of the TR25 Trophy, basically a BSA Starfire Restyled and fitted with Triumph badges. The Greaves Anglian. Paralysed since birth, Derry Preston Cobb, it is said, but his cousin Bert Greaves that he couldn't fit an Atco lawnmower engine to his wheelchair, and thus was planted the seed that would become the Invercar business. Because after World War II, there would be great demand for such a vehicle. But there was also a considerable demand for two-wheeled personal transport, and Greaves knew that this could be a great avenue for the company to make extra money. And so in 1951, Bert Greaves would unveil the prototype of his first motorcycle, and a very unusual beast it was too. Because while the 197cc Villiers engine was fairly conventional, that was pretty much the only thing on the machine that was. But while the prototype was highly unusual, and viewed rather quizzically by the press at the time, by the mid-50s, the company was doing quite well, smelling modest numbers of its machines for both road and off-road purposes. But it was off-road where the machines really excelled, and the company would have considerable success with its Horston motocross bike and the Anglian trials bike. Early machines made use of either British Anzani engines or Villiers power units. 
although later this would be almost exclusively Villiers unit, albeit with a number of engine modifications, especially the top end, performed by the company themselves. The Anglian made use of a Greaves 37A engine, albeit with a modified aluminium head and barrel. It was of 246 cc's and had a bore and stroke of 66 by 72. The first models, made in 1966, would make use of the famous Banana leading link front fork, although later models would use fairly conventional telescopic forks. And the Greaves was typically nimble of the day, weighing in at just 203 pounds or 92 kilos. And in competition, the Anglin was regarded as the best lightweight trials machine of its day. Many works riders and privateers gained premier rewards in events such as the Scottish Six Day Trial and the European Trial Championships. These days it's common to see these bikes listed on the worst bikes of all time, even over YouTube videos or on social media. This is of course complete nonsense and is really based purely on the looks of the bikes. They all look fairly unusual. But Greaves motorcycles were highly successful and were definitely a case of function leading over form. Greaves would survive the collapse of Villiers by producing their own power units and would remain successful in off-road competition until the end of the company in 1976. What bikes or collections of bikes would you like to see us cover in a future video? Maybe you've got a bike we can use for a test ride either way, get in touch below. Hope you enjoyed the video, if you did, don't forget to like and subscribe, and of course, thank you very much for watching.